This is Simon Fraser University on a really, really nice day, which unfortunately that is not what we uh, have uh, today at this time of year. But it is the inspiration and also the mountains in the background, which uh, even though this is an old photograph and there's certainly more encroachment up the mountain these days of human habitation, we are very close to nature, to the natural uh, world. And of course, in British Columbia, that has been contested of logging and mining and fishing, things like that. And, but yet it did uh, produce in the 1970s, uh, Greenpeace and a whole kind of set of environmental activism that you, I'm sure, know something of the evolution of that. And Schaefer made a contribution in terms of what we call acoustic ecology that should be on the same agenda as uh, as other environmental uh, concerns. So today um, I'm actually going to be giving you an introduction to soundscape composition which was in one sense there right from the beginning because as you know Schaefer and many of the research assistants and colleagues at SFU were composers, not all. It wasn't our main concern for this project. It was quite definitely about the acoustic environment. Uh, and, but from that, we had both a pedagogical base, a research base, and an evolving compositional base. So that's what I'm going to start with uh, today. Um, I, although I think some of you, hopefully all of you, know a certain amount about it, but it is important in the, uh, to, to talk to you about how this has evolved. So I'm going to start with uh, my model that uh, some of you will have heard me speak of this before, but I still feel it's kind of the best way to, and perhaps the most abstract way, to, to deal with the subjects <laughs> of the, the interdisciplinary aspects of what we're talking about, what I call inner and outer complexity. The inner complexity, this bottom part, is basically the world of electroacoustic music. Uh, and many of us come from that background, but not all, but it is uh, studio-based and now uh, quite, quite common. And we are quite used to dealing with sound objects if we want to use the acousmatic nomenclature. In fact, this is how I would teach studio uh, con uh, content and techniques. And so we become increasingly, through digital audio, we become increasingly uh, familiar with powerful resources to, to deal with sound as its own sake. And that extends, as you've alluded to, right down to microsound, the, the level that is pretty much uh, can only be dealt with uh, uh, digitally. So there is a lot of complexity, what I would call inner complexity, uh, that we deal with with sound. However, the traditions of outer complexity in Western in the Western canon of classical music has been tended to be relegated to um, a secondary concern, uh, program music, extra musical uh, implications, um, not regarded as fundamental. And I would say, even though uh, acousmatic music is still very much, I would say, a central approach to dealing with sound in terms of processing and that kind of sensitivity to sound qualities. But I think soundscape composition would integrate the external world and its complexity, the outer complexity of the real world. And the, that, has, that seems to be increasing, if nothing else, uh, with environmental concerns, social concerns, political concerns, economic you, health concerns, most, uh, most recently, and so on and so forth. So we don't have a long tradition, except I would suggest, as, uh, in terms of soundscape composition, for integrating those, uh, those aspects. Even though electroacoustic music, I mean, and, and electroacoustic and audio sound, um, it can be used for any, any purpose and not just uh, aesthetic. But we don't have very good models for that. And that's one thing that we have tried to uh, encourage, to develop. And so today I'm going to try to show you through examples uh, from our work uh, how that might actually, how that might actually uh, be, be involved, um, just through a, a example. <clears throat> 
um, in a meaningful way, that is to say, and uh, in, in a, from a compositional uh, point of view. So for me, the work, uh, the work works best when there is not this static relationship, but you might say a dynamic yin yang, dare I say, uh, interaction between the interaction of the external world and the processing of the inner world and a constant reference back and forth in a, in a dynamic compositional process. That I think is ultimately what is really new about uh, this, not to mention how it acquires social relevance. Uh, I just want to mention to the organizers here that the there's a time left of nine, I guess, nine minutes. I'm not sure what that means, because obviously I'll be going on for a lot longer than nine minutes. <laughs> OK, um, I do want to put uh, mention, though, this last point on the on the diagram here, where there's inner and outer complexity of sound is not just something that is um, uh, abstract. It's actually. Yes, that's what I, th I thought the recording needs to to be continued here. Um, OK, uh, what I'm saying is that the inner and outer complexity of sound is actually based on the everyday perception of, of sound in acoustic communication. That model that I've outlined in my book, Acoustic Communication, particularly this one here, uh, is, is that we have two sources of information that we derive from sound. Uh, one is from the inner structure, the, the, uh, the inner patterns if you will. And the part in brackets here, micro event and macro, just reminds us that there are multiple time levels to, to structure. And we can now access all of those with microsound. And the box labeled context is, of course, our outer, our outer knowledge, our knowledge of the real world and how to interpret, how to turn this into meaning, how to separate sound and derive meaning. And that is endlessly uh, rich and of course culturally defined and can change and there's it's uh, not a fixed thing and it puts the emphasis on listening and on the uh, competence if you will the uh, auditory competence of listeners uh, and perhaps would influence that co uh, that competence through giving audio experiences oral experiences that are that are enhancing because a lot of our day-to-day uh, -day work and day-to-day -day, day -day living simply takes that outer world of, of the environment for granted. We're on what we call automatic pilot a lot of the time. Uh, that is, you know, means that we habituate. So that is a pitfall. And of course, the putting the emphasis on listening, which was Schaefer's brilliant move from simply being anti-noise to make it listener-centered, that, of course, is what has given it the power and the uh, relevance right down to the present day that we inherit uh, from, from, from him. Now, I cannot talk about every aspect of soundscape composition. In fact, I've divided it in, in my writing into a continuum, and that continuum is I've divided here into two parts, the left-hand part here where I'm putting in the middle of the absolute continuum, phonography. Phonography or found sound uh, is like photography, is, is of the more documentary type of recording, for instance, uh, where not that there is any ob objectivity to it. Every field recordist knows that everything is a matter of personal choice and technical choice and contextual choice, but it still is, its aim is generally documentary with, for instance, either minimal processing or transparent processing, and, uh, and usually engender some kind of ethics as to how, what is reasonable, what is representative. So that, of course, starts to, to raise anthropological issues as well, which we'll get back to. To the left of that, uh, I'm arbitrarily putting sonification or audification as a mapping, data mapping. And that can be either mapped onto sound, sonification, or more restrictively interpreted as sound, audification uh, is, is that. I'm not going to be talking about that, but I, I do want to put a, 
uh, a tribute out there to those sound artists who are using that, for instance, to map climate change data, for instance, or any other social uh, issue. Uh, in other words, it is perhaps art in the service of science or for the communication of the science that is involved. Uh, we could also uh, reference the popularity now of installation work, particularly in art galleries or sound sculptures, outdoor things, things that are somehow activated by the real world or suggested. And uh, this remapping starts to create, a, a, you might say, a, a virtual world. This is not the area that I personally deal with, but I have a great respect for uh, people such as Andrea Polly in the United States, who has done a lot of this sonification work, or Matthew Bertner in uh, his Echo Sono uh, projects, well documented, and that are dealing with very direct uh, interaction with the soundscape, basically. I'm talking mainly, and my experience is mainly on the other side of it, representing the real in terms of soundscape. So I've now got the right hand part of the continuum, which I'm going to argue goes from a more documentary approach. Um, and in fact, I have this is largely where the World Soundscape Project started, as I'll show you in a minute, and moving into uh, abstracted versions of it, not abstract versions, but abstracted things that are based on or processed from the real world. Um, uh, recordings, not necessarily, not always the, from the from recordings, but because it could involve synthesis. Uh, and eventually it ends up in imaginary worlds, which I have to say I'm, I'm quite fascinated by. And because of our use now, uh, our standard use of multi-channel, I always think of eight and multiples of eight, or any number for that matter. Uh, particularly in Europe, there are dedicated uh, installations for multi-channel <laughs> playback and, and uh, experience, which is very immersive. And when we say imaginary worlds, um, we think of virtual reality, but mostly that conjures up sort of, you know, computer graphic gaming type things. I'm talking about things that would still evoke the realism of the real world, even though it's not, um, uh, not uh, it doesn't have to be uh, totally settled there. In fact, there's an, an inner world that is also part of, of this, which is the metaphor, symbolism, memory. There's uh, that, of course, that aspect of uh, imagine, our imagination um, is very much at play, as, as we will see. I just want to name drop a few prominent uh, figures in the field. Uh, phonography has been discussed by John Drever a great deal from Goldsmiths in terms of the ethics of it, uh, ethnography versus sonic tourism, right? Uh, how, who gets to represent what and for whom? And uh, is, it all, is it all neutral or uh, do, we, do we have some responsibility to the materials from the real world, particularly if they have some sensitivity to them? There is an alternative. I, I would argue that free sound and other libraries like that that have very little contextual information uh, are really just invitations to use raw material. Note, note the metaphor. And it's kind of an industrialized metaphor, raw data that's processed. And that would in involve basically theoretically no, no connection to the real world. It's just data, right? And uh, I'm not saying that's wrong, but I just say that when our practice would evoke that. His colleague, uh, Greg Wagstaff, has, has in with his traveling uh, exhibitions of sound and field projects, uh, such as ones in Scotland, uh, have inv involved participants. So it's not just experts, but it's uh, working with communities, for instance. Um, the well-known ethnomusicologist, Stephen Felt, has proposed acoustomology as, as a kind of epistemology of sound, how we know the world through sound, for instance, uh, which is very much a variation on soundscape as perceived and understood. Um, and he has contributed a lot to our understanding of other cultures. My friend and colleague Hildegard Westerkamp, of course, has had a, a started with the World Soundscape Project and has developed her own career as a very powerful voice for acoustic ecology, environmental activism and sheer uh, questions of acoustic sustainability, which are, are involved. 
And of course, from bioacoustics, we, we now tend to understand acoustic ecology as not just the human world or the built environment, but also the bioacoustic world that's also equally threatened in its own way. And his niche hypothesis is a very strong contribution to all of this. So uh, those are just people that whose names I would recommend to you for uh, further thought about this subject. And I won't, um, I'll just simply go on now to soundscape composition and give you a very brief um, primer or background of the World Soundscape Project. This is the so-called iconic picture from 1973 with uh, the late Murray Schaefer and his team of, of research assistants, Bruce Davis, Peter Hoos, myself, and Howard, Howard Broomfield. Uh, this uh, iconic picture at SFU has been modeled and used by my students and colleagues here for <laughs> the modern, they are much hipper looking, they have portable <laughs> equipment, you know, they don't have uh, nerdy glasses and beards and hair like that. It's, it's a <laughs> cultural change. But I regard this as, of course, a, a wonderful um, uh, legacy that has has come out of uh, out of this work. And Hildegard Westerkamp, uh, there's a photo uh, further on on this page. This is the introductory page for most of the WSP documentations online. Uh, very briefly, the, the initial recordings that were done in Vancouver in 71 to 73 were completely collectively done by the group, uh, not individually authored. Uh, we just worked collectively because we were all research assistants and working in the Sonic Research Studio. And I'm not going to play these examples, but some of them may be familiar to you as very documentary. The only one that, that was um, started to become more compositional was harbor the harbor ambience and the entrance to the harbor and in particular the sound marks that are one of the uh, main ideas unique sounds in the environment whether they're official or perhaps more personally chosen um, but the entrance to the harbor was a simulation it had to be a simulation of, of taking a ferry trip from the outer harbor here past this diaphone or foghorn at Point Atkinson underneath the uh, Lionsgate Bridge into the Inner Harbor and docking. And that was an actual ferry route in those days, uh, not right now. And uh, so, but that, that boat ride had to be simulated. And this story has been told many, many times uh, about uh, that, how it had to be pieced together from individual recordings. So that was composition that that was was in a sort of prototypical kind of form whereas the recordings of the sound marks and the, for better or worse we called it the music of horns and whistles well let's face it the kind of sound signals of horns and whistles uh, are perhaps arguably the closest to traditional musical sounds of being pitched and and tuned and uh, even when they are uh, sounded as in the New Year's Eve uh, celebration where all the boats in the harbor would sound their whistles into a great giant Ivesian type of, uh, <laughs> of uh, texture uh, that uh, it's still, they still are easy to listen to as if they were music. But of course, Schaefer argued that listening to all of these sounds as if they were musical, in other words, with the same kind of attention um, at least prior to it becoming an accompaniment environment through background music and iPod listening, uh, which has changed listening uh, forever. There's also, of course, in the documentary side, there were uh, documentaries about the changing soundscape. That was already there because, for instance, the, these sound signals and sound marks in Vancouver already were changing even as we were documenting them. And certainly when we came back, to this later on. I'll be mentioning the uh, Holy Rosary bells in a minute uh, in a context. That was the only sound marks that were bells in, in Vancouver, except for a couple of chimes um, in the European style. And the this is the famous diagram of the profile of how far the sounds could be heard. Whereas in a hundred years earlier, uh, it was in fact, the tallest building in in the young city of Vancouver, and so it could be heard throughout, you know, miles and miles away. 
uh, and now only over a few blocks. And that captured the imagination of people in, since as to, and certainly Schaefer, who argued about how that implication of uh, the decline of, of, say, the church as, as a organizing feature of the soundscape compared with traffic and aircraft. Um, this was followed up by, in 1996, there is a historical uh, longitudinal aspect of this, uh, where now various composers were asked to come. We now had soundscape composers. These were ones from Canada and Germany. The German ones were uh, Sabina Breitzemeter and Hans Ulrich Werner were associated with the radio. And that was typical of that time, that it was not regarded as part of, say, avant-garde music or contemporary music. It came from the radiophonic background, which is not uh, accidental. On the heritage side, since there is a historical theme here, I just want to mention everything that I'm talking about today is documented on the World WSP database, including the original recordings. And I just want to point out that these collections uh, have the, um, particularly for Vancouver, have a longitudinal aspect. The original recordings from the 1970s, and then on digital tape from the 1990s, and then digital files uh, from Vancouver in 2020. And uh, there is now even, oh, sorry, yes, that's right. No, he, he, actually here, the, the actual digital files in 10 years ago, and then now uh, a COVID kind of inspired set of, of recordings made by our Swedish postdoc, Jacek uh, Smoliki, um, who was here during the COVID shutdown and used his time profitably for that. Also, um, everything I'm going to be doing now is in, is actually can be found here in my HTML documentation. You'll see that in a moment. And I'm also teaching an online, or there is an online tutorial uh, uh, for the Handbook for Acoustic Ecology with uh, 20 modules that are useful for, for teaching and learning. And that can be done uh, individually or uh, as, a, uh, as a group, which I'm actually leading now, um, a, a very international group. It works very well actually for webinars. Okay, but back to uh, the soundscape there very briefly. Then I also just want to mention the Soundscapes of Canada, this radio series that also, without necessarily intending to, develop the compositional aspect of this into 10 one hour radio programs. And so the whole continuum uh, of this, a more documentary, although it's rather poetic actually, six themes of the soundscape, little mini lectures, uh, uh, ear cleaning, um, lecture or talk by Schaefer, and then um, compositions. Uh, Bruce Davis did two of them, uh, games and work uh, that were based on processing the, the sounds uh, from all of the field recordings that he had done. Another illustrated lecture here about signals, keynotes and sound marks, and then taking the Vancouver sound marks and extending that across Canada with the work of Peter Hoos. Uh, that uh, took representative sound marks uh, in Canada, which of course has been pointed out in these days represent our colonial history and so on. And this is of course quite true, the way Canada was settled and developed in, in these, uh, around these communities and including their acoustic communication. Um, possibly the one of the most suggestive uh, programs here was the summer solstice, the 24 hour summer solstice recordings that the whole team did collectively uh, near a pond on the grounds of a rural abbey. Um, so it was actually, even though I don't think we were in touch with Bernie Krause in 1974, that happened later, but it was contemporaneous with him also starting to record complete natural environments uh, and soundscapes and not just the um, typical biological approach of isolating species and classifying them, which is, of course, the kind of a very Western tradition. So he was also recording entire um, uh, rec uh, soundscapes and realizing that there were frequency niches uh, 
uh, in, in terms of how they are organized. We observe that just simply casually without theorizing it when we made very qualitative um, sense of how the sound mapping of how the soundscape changed, particularly when we noticed how the nighttime frogs cross-faded to use the audio term with the bird song and then how it all evolved and that gave us an impression a very striking impression compared to the compared to the noise of vancouver that we had already documented it gave us a very striking impression of how a functioning bioacoustic environment just one uh one day in the middle of a season in the middle of of a longer evolution um, but it was balanced and functional right in in natural kinds of ways and we didn't understand entirely how that worked but we did sense the acoustic balance uh, of of that so it was an important aspect of it uh peter hoos is he's a writer as well as composer uh he uh he and bruce davis had been collecting various bits of of um, instructions for directions every time they stopped on their cross Canada tour and asked for directions, <laughs> the Niagara recorder was on. <laughs> and uh, they just, of course, it was fairly neutral material, but in those days, we didn't worry too much about permissions. And besides, they were just asking for directions. And so he edited those together. And it's not comprehensive of all the dialects of Canada, of course, because it was just happenstance. It was actually a very clever way of doing that and then editing those together. Something that, that again, uh, just like we would never be able to sit and listen for 24 hours, you know, in one place and experience that kind of soundscaping. In, instead, we have this time compression. Um, our version was two minutes out of the original hour uh, of the recordings. And again, with directions, then it was just little sound bites of people talking about um, how to get somewhere. And because of the neutrality of the content you would listen to how it was going the rest are basically compositions of one sort or another by the various excerpts that by the various composers rather um, individually and including oral history for instance the parish priest uh, in in quebec uh in the gaspésie uh, per se uh, and that's a very poetic documentary and i contributed um, maritime sound diary and so on and so forth so this was the beginning of of then a more documentary approach and i'm going to skip over just to show you the uh hildegard westerkamp uh, who did a huge amount of work in uh, for the cataloging of the collection that we now have have uh online and i'll explain at the end how you can get guest expert guest access to that with a password so at this point, I'm going to now just go to um, soundscape approaches. I'm going to just skip over these principles for the moment and just give you an overview of, of what the, I was just implying about the early work and how it tended to manifest itself in terms of composition. First of all, the range of approaches from the phonographic, the found sound, and that uh, included things like an unedited New Year's Eve recording uh, that was listened to as if it were music, as well as a time compression version of it for a longer period. And that was actually done also in Europe, uh, the 24 hour recording in uh, an Italian town, Cembra, part of the five villages. And uh, parts of that were uh, shorter versions of that were done as a dawn chorus, uh, similar to the summer solstice, but heard uh, almost in, in their entirety or shortened if necessary. And that, that had been done in, in uh, Northern uh, England and also in Brittany in, in France. Uh, so it's the, the first, uh, oh, okay, that's, I was talking about found sound that had been edited together and uh, moving towards abstractedness is an ultimately a virtual kind of a, uh, approach. So from field recording then, which is where this was all based, uh, then it establishes various standard spatial perspectives, such as the fixed one, where you're just simply setting up a microphone and uh, doing a 
uh, a recording depending on the type of microphone that you're using. Or it could be a discrete series of those. It could be time compressed, there could be a narrative or a running commentary there. It could involve oral history. There's many, many aspects of, of this very simple, um, basically soundscape monitoring, um, which also could be indoors, of course, and, and involve interview subjects and so on. Uh, the techniques um, tend to be a layering in stereo. I might give an example of that uh, later. Well, actually, it's almost there entirely with the eight-channel work. I'll come back to these um, early soundscape pieces, Pendler Drum and Island. Uh, I've talked about time compression. Also, keeping in mind uh, the poetry can be involved, Hildegard Westerkamp, uh, Whisper Study, for instance. I've, I've quoted uh, Shakespeare and Prospero in a piece I've already mentioned Bruce Davis's work, and uh, then transitions, which I'm I'm going to play a little bit later from Hildegard's work. The other type of uh, spatial perspective is the sound walk, with or without recording. Um, usually, it's a good idea not to mix the two, uh, to have a listening walk that focuses on listening or to have a recording walk, but it's usually better to precede the recording walk with the sound walk uh, so that you have uh, an idea of how things will change spatially and to plan your route accordingly. I think that's already a proto-composition because you're choosing what to record, how, what type of environment you're in, what type of soundscape, what's its affect, how does it change, moving between it is basically a journey of one sort or another and so that starts creating a sense of structure there can also be simulated motion as there was in the entrance to the harbor mainly as crude as it was in 1973 um, just cross fading and having sounds recede in the distance through standard studio techniques but it can also go from the real to the imaginary or the remembered i think this is always a good thing to remember that processing and the impact of environmental sounds is, is, is often as much in the memory of them or the imagination of them as it is to simply what is present at any point. And so you can evoke that. If you're really going to evoke people's reactions, then you have that whole world to deal with. A good example of both the fixed and moving perspective can be found in my 1996 piece Pendler Drum, which was uh, arguably the first uh, eight-channel piece that I did uh, that could be regarded as a soundscape composition. Pendler Drum uh, was commissioned by a group in Copenhagen, and uh, they their theme was commuting, and evidently in in Danish, a commuter is a pendler. And uh, typical of following the same path every day, you tend to fall into a daydream. And so that's where the drome part comes from it. They sent me one hour of beautifully recorded material from Copenhagen train station, a place that I had been many times. And so um, I decided that the first uh, section of the piece where the commuter arrives at the station uh, at the end of the day, actually, which was the way it was actually recorded, would just simply be a way of evoking being in that in that huge uh, space. So, um, with no transformation or very very little, I combined four different stereo tracks uh, in the eight channel. Now, the commission was stereo, but I had just installed my own eight channel sound system in my home studio, so I was actually listening to it with this surround sound. So, of course, all of these tracks were originally recorded uh, sequentially, but there's nothing to prevent you from making them simultaneous. And that, of course, I suppose means the station is a little busier than it actually was, but it's still very realistic. So four of the tracks that come in right at the beginning are just simply uh, placed around you. The only difference is that instead of the channels being adjacent, I, I skipped one so that it would give a little broader stereo perspective. And then uh, four more uh, tracks come in, two stereo tracks come in, and the only difference there is that one of them with the public address announcements uh, is doubled, so it comes from different directions. So you have an immersive experience for the first two minutes, and that, that establishes uh, the scene quite, quite well.
Then uh, we fall into a daydream, and uh, in the dream section, um, two of the tracks, uh, seven and eight here, they remain uh, unpro unprocessed, so they provide a continuity of the ambience. And then I use two different loops. One is of a big international train passing that is quite repetitive. And it is processed by gradually putting in a resonator. And you can hear that I'm bringing up the feedback quite slowly. And so that simulates moving gradually into this dreamlike section. There's also a percussive loop from the train itself. Not a particularly good loop, uh, but you don't actually need to, uh, to worry about the break in this particular case. And it's also resonated uh, with stereo and, and tuned uh, appropriately. So here's how the entire uh, sequence is is going to uh, is going to sound. emphasized in the second daydream on the local train or little sound bites that came come back or uh, that come back in your mind once you settle into the local train then little fragments of sound of you might say earworms if you know the german term uh come back and you kind of repeat them so it, it has not only the realistic part of it but it's also the psychological uh experience of it so that, that was something that people could relate to, right? So there's where the outer complexity of commuting and it's uh, the falling into a daydream and that could be, um, could be emphasized. Um, shortly after that, the, the early piece Island uh, constructed a overview of, of a visit to an imaginary island uh, with these six scenes uh, to it.
and they involved having highly realistic sounds just like the Copenhagen ones but combined simultaneously with the uh, processed ones so in the this, I know you can't follow all, all of this but the big big idea here is there's eight tracks here of uh, sorry let's take the bottom ones there's eight tracks here of unprocessed sounds except for some subtle spatial processing there actually are individual waves plus an ambient wave that are placed in the north south east and west uh, directions in the eight channel so suddenly it's realistic except you're surrounded by it uh, but there's no there's no fear of drowning uh, going on and then those same sounds a high pass version and a low pass versions are again put into uh, resonators and uh, and processed so it uh, let's just play this opening here which comes from the first track on the Vancouver soundscape actually So the process sounds are deliberately made to be foreign, uh, evocative, it attract your attention, adds some sense of mystery, or maybe even a magical atmosphere of it. And uh, they contrast strikingly with the highly realistic, in fact, I would even say hyper-realistic, close mic little waves that uh, came from a beach and the Vancouver uh, soundscape. Then as we progress up the river, I'll just play an excerpt from the cistern or this cavern, because it also uh, is uh, in, uh, used in the next piece probably that I will go to. These were recordings by David Monaki of, uh, of a pozzo, a well in, uh, in Italy, and he lowered a microphone down into it. And these are these beautiful recordings where uh, now when you hear them, the dripping water, uh, the resonance of the uh, cavern or the well uh, gives a spatial sense of it. And then that is the processing is either those are slightly extended through granulation or are resonated a little bit. So it is much more integrated in terms of the original and the processing. Mm -hmm. 
So the examples so far show something that I've always favored with my soundscape work, which is to work, I would say, within the sound. Uh, things that bring out the inner qualities of it. And so I've mentioned two things anyway, and we're going to go farther on that theme. Uh, one is resonating. As you know, you can't resonate a frequency that's not there. You, have to, you can enhance it, but you, can't, you don't add it. It's still a linear process. So the resonators basically prolong uh, the sound. It's kind of a natural amplification, and we're doing that in the studio. And then the time stretching that was used, granular time stretching, again, is also just changing the time scale and adding texture, admittedly, the way that I implement it myself. But it is still just simply changing the time domain. And in the auditory system, the spectral envelope and the temporal envelope are nicely balanced in the auditory system. Uh, particularly in language, where we get both spectral envelopes on vowels and temporal envelopes on consonants, to simplify a little bit, <laughs> a lot actually. Uh, but we are constantly having those two detection mechanisms in the auditory system, and, and it's worth considering uh, how they are balanced. But then when you change the time scale without changing the pitch, then it changes the whole perception and throws it more towards the spectral domain. Right? When you stretch the sound in, in time, you are much more aware, you have more time to concentrate on the spectral domain. Right, So those are things that work from within the sound and simply extend. Right, And I find that aesthetically um, you know, attractive in, in terms of working with the inner complexity of the sound and not just simply imposing something unrelated uh, onto it. Although I did give you an example of what seems to be a foreign element, the drones, uh, there for a particular purpose. Uh, but that's just to establish that. By the time we get to the later uh, thing, the uh, forest at night, um, the the integration of original and processed, I just, I won't play it, but I'll just tell you anecdotally that even I couldn't tell where one started and the other stopped. I had to literally stop one of them and, and hear the additive effect. So um, in terms of then techniques, um, a very important um, turn came with Temple in 2002 because I wanted to start working with um, convolution. I'd heard about it, but I hadn't actually experimented with it. And so most people learn convolution, and it's still probably the best way, is to do impulse reverb, the, to get the impulse response of, for instance, say, this church in Busetto in, in Italy, uh, which was recorded, I'll play it to you later, by breaking a balloon <laughs> in that space, presumably with some permission. But you can't, you know, do this with firing off a starter pistol or something like that. That's definitely not the way to do it, even though an acoustician uh, probably would prefer that. So uh, the first experiments that I, I did in that uh, were just go back here, where I'll just show you some uh, simple ones, where uh, three simple voices, uh, sorry, individual voices, they're not simple, uh, counter tenor, uh, an alto, and a bass uh, were recorded in the studio on just fairly neutral notes or maybe a small melodic uh, sort of uh, passage. And the basso here, well, first of all, I should play the uh, the impulse response of the cathedral, because instead of using digital reverb, if you have the impulse response of a space, then convolving it together makes the sound appear as if it originated in that space uh, in the same at the same distance that the sound was from the, the microphone. So this is a bit loud and sudden, but I you're probably uh, I think you can manage it, but this is actual complex reverb. I'll play it again. All right. And in a demo that I have in the teaching materials, we can jump around to 12 different uh, uh, impulse responses, and we hear how the character of each space changes. It's not just the reverb time, which is obviously long there, but also the color and quality of it. Because usually through precedence effect, we our auditory systems tend to suppress 
the reverb at the in order to enhance the direct sound. So the um, I'll just play you say the most uh, uh, dramatic examples, uh, which of the actually I think the combination. This is the 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 basso Derek Christians uh, a low D and a high D uh, together. Now we're going to put him in that church, and I don't even have to <laughs> fly him over to do it. And isn't that positively gorgeous? Um, and then, and it's so realistic because the uh, uh, impulse reverb uh, and the convolution actually models exactly that process. It multiplies the spectrum of the source with the spectrum of the space, just which is basically means that every sound is colored by the acoustic space that it's in. But the mathematical representation of that is uh, can be captured with convolving uh, the two sounds together. Um, and it's realistic because it's essentially a mathematical description of what happens. Now, to go beyond that, I've suggested or started experimenting with convolving the sound with itself, which I've called autoconvolution. I'm not sure that term is used yet in the literature, but it's, it's obvious what it means, convolving with itself. So that means that you are going to um, emphasize the strong frequencies and de-emphasize the, the weak frequencies because strong with strong gets stronger and weak with weak gets weaker. So a 10 to one becomes 100 to one if that were a ratio. It also follows the reverb rule that the duration extends by the sum of the two sources. So we're used to uh, reverb being an extra tail at the end, and in this case, it's going to double the length. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to go from the auto convolved to auto convolved and convolved with the church. And you'll hear how the harmonics in his voice, he's already has a very rich voice anyway, uh, are coming out. So in the piece, which I'm not going to play because I don't have the time for it, uh, is that everything that is original uh, in the uh, tracks is, is simultaneously played with the convolt. So we have those pitches in the first eight tracks and we're simulating a choir as a result, and then the uh, auto convolt versions are coming in. So actually, the convolved ones are actually at the top here, convolved with themselves. So they last twice as long. And so therefore, it's like an extension of the reverb. So again, we have a very natural sound as if there was a choir there. And then uh, it, it, but the tail extends to something halfway between the the original and the reverberation. So that I found was quite a wonderful technique. And to jump ahead, because I still would like to play some other examples. Um, in 2009, then I think this is the piece, Chalice Well, that is the most um, uh, creating a virtual world because it used several of the sounds that we've already heard and other voice vocal sounds, but a lot of it was dripping water along the lines of the David Menaki. And I was thought of wells, and the one chalice well in Glastonbury is a historic sacred site, has a modern uh, top to the well. You don't really hear anything there, but the legends are numerous. And uh, the one that caught my attention was 
the the monks suggested there that there were underground caverns and this is where um, Joseph of Arimathea had placed the Holy Grail to protect us from the underworld. Well, of course, not surprisingly, these caverns have never been found or documented, um, and uh, nor has the Grail, but um, it's very suggestive. Um, <laughs> cynics say, well, they were trying to produce, uh, promote tourism, <laughs> and some things, I guess, have never changed. But it freed up my imagination to imagine that we could go into such um, a, a descent and into somewhat imaginary uh, chambers, such as the one that the, the whole well has been gendered as, as feminine over the millennia. And the tor, the tower, as you see on the right, the earth mound is, is a, been a masculine symbol. So there's been a high degree of, of myth and symbolism going on there. So the, uh, the examples then are all hybridized Con convolved versions of source materials, including even um, granular synthesis ones, which I'll skip over, and consonants from the language, and I'll just concentrate on, on the ones, because we've already heard the splashes in the well, and if we convolve that with, for instance, here, uh, a domestic water stream. I like this example because it's so banal. Right. And so the kind of sound that I tell my students, you probably shouldn't use these. And so when the water stream uh, here is convolved, for instance, with the the well uh, sound. Such or the splashes uh, of, of it. OK, uh, let's just take the individual well sounds, first of all. It, all, it, it obviously softens the hard edge of the banal stream and then creates a texture out of it because every impulse of the, in the well creates a whole stream, you might say, itself, right? And then if it's a more continuous sound, such as the splashes, it'll go farther. Here, for instance, then is something that's not water, is the glass breaking sound convolved with the well. So that's clearly a hybrid. And then I can also go to, um, oh, actually it's back here, to some bubbles that David also did with the well. I'll just keep these simple examples here. So notice that the uh, the spatial aspect is still there because of the cavern, but then you get these more imaginary types of sounds. And in, this is these are all eight channel pieces, of course. But even in stereo, I think it gives you a sense of of immersion. Here is the uh, the second section of the piece in stereo, uh, where the we these are now eight channel mixes, which are much more difficult to document, but you get the sense here that there's a eight hybrids that are, well, four stereo hybrids, eight channels that are placed around you. So even though this looks complex, it's really just a four eight channel sources, right? To make 32. And that in the eight channel just gives you the spatial uh, effect of, having those as discrete sources around you. And they're all kind of family variants, as, as you can see on, 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 on this. So here's what one of those sections might sound like. 
including a vocal sound source. And similarly, here's a little bit of the glass chamber since you heard a glass example. So I hope that's clear how that has created a sense of an imaginary type of environment, an imaginary soundscape. And given the fact that it's that it's supposed to be mythical uh, and not actual, uh, you can take a lot of liberties. And in fact, it's it, it basically softens the, the edges, makes it a little bit more blurred, imaginative. And the hybridization also maybe creates a set of sense of metaphor or symbolism such as the use of the vocal female vocal formants in the first example that I played. At the other end of the continuum, I think arguably my most uh, phonographic uh, piece would be 2018 Bells of Salzburg, uh, where I had been invited to, to uh, attend and create a new piece. And of course, I thought of the 1975 recordings made by the World Soundscape Project in that city. And since even the locals describe it as a bit of a museum city, uh, nothing much has changed. And, and the bells are in this kind of bowl shaped valley are just simply saturating. There are so many churches and bells and things, and they're just a constant accompaniment to the lives of the people living there. And so at the risk of uh, the proverbial coals to Newcastle, I was taking bell sounds back to Salzburg, but actually they, they quite liked it because uh, they, they could recognize they, they had a, an association with them. The bells, of course, have had a long history also of change during the war. Of course, European bells tended to be seized for armaments, and then they had to be recast at the end of the war. This is uh, five of them that were replaced in 1961, I believe it was, yeah, 61, including the huge 14,000 kilogram Salvatore Mundi, right, the bells. And of course, they're tuned in certain ways uh, and they have names and history and so on and so forth. So um, I, I actually was able to use all of the uh, soundscape recordings from 1975 because they spent quite a bit of time there on um, on a high 
feast day, uh, Palm Sunday, I believe it was, when the even the Salvatore Mundi is is played. And when I went back in 2018, in fact, it was the first Sunday in Advent. And so I actually got, finally got to hear in firsthand these um, uh, these sounds. And in fact, they reacted exactly the way I suspected they would in, in this ancient uh, city, which is that not only are they ubiquitous, they go from early morning to late at night, and they're very spatial because of the way everything's spread out, but that when you're hearing, for instance, the cathedral bells in the old town, right, and with all the reflecting surfaces, it just creates a totally immersive soundscape that you're just swimming in these sounds. So on the one hand, this is very, um, very documentary because I take the 17 hours from 7 a.m. till midnight and condense it into 17 minutes. And then the processing is mainly uh, during the bell, the bell sequences, of course. Um, and they usually just involve auto convolution the way that you've, you've already heard. So this thins it out and prolongs it. But then in the eight channel version, I use a spatialization that has long delays uh, as if the sound is re reflecting off of all the surfaces around you, which it really does. And even though this will be just be stereo, um, you, you will be able to hear. So again, it's, uh, you, well, you can briefly see here that in this section that we are just simply having various convolved parts. The star indicates convolution here. So, uh, and multiple repetitions of, of that. So we're not going to try to figure that out right now. I'm just going to play you a section of leading up to the, um, the midday uh, peal of the, the bells. So we're walking through the cobblestone streets. Um, there's a wonderful sequence of the little boy who's imitating the bells. And then we go into the rings. And in eight channels, again, you'd be surrounded by those. I'm not going to play you the full peel of bells because the um, uh, 
it really overwhelms the stereo and this kind of transmission. That's just a single bell there, but you could hear how the harmonics were coming out and being prolonged. One of the characteristics of the convolution is that it softens the attack. In fact, it takes out the attack and just leaves the prominent uh, frequencies. So even with the procession, for instance, just a little bit of that, the priest and the choir and the people milling, processing around the square, you can hear how that, how that is smoothing out. That softening is even more striking. I don't have time for it, but earth and steel, the large shipbuilding uh, sounds that where the attacks are being removed or uh, from the unseen world where our piano arpeggios are also reduced to a swirl of harmonics in, in, in that sense. Um, maybe one more excerpt and then I think we better leave it because we want to leave a little bit of room for time. Uh, the Garden of Sonic Delights is also a kind of in-between realistic and, and symbolic using um, up to 48 uh, channels and that was because it was commissioned for the Beast system in, in Birmingham as some of you may know. Uh, a fantastic system in that they've installed in their, in their main hall. Um, but it can be done in 8 or 16 but it just goes to show that you can have very three-dimensional types of, um, of spaces. Also the Sonic Arts Lab at, uh, in, at Sark in, in uh, Northern Ireland in Belfast. Um, the most recent piece I did was very much a pandemic kind of piece, uh, so I thought I might just end up with that. This is uh, called Rainforest Raven and it was the materials were all done on the west coast island, the Gulf Island uh, called Galliano that's near uh, Vancouver. And uh, there was just a lot of wonderful types of sounds that could also be uh, autoconvolved and, and hybridized, including dripping water, for instance, uh, on the side of the rocks, and um, a lucky recording of a raven going overhead that I took to be the kind of guide. Um, so all of these, all of this is. Um, outlined here in terms of the techniques. Mainly it's just convolved with itself. You can also, by the way, um, use what's called a moving window where something like the Raven, for instance, um, here is the equalized version of it. And then by doing various moving windows, you can have echoes and repeat. Right. And, um, and then the water itself, there's an interesting version of that, which is then the resonated, and I, I won't just play that. The dripping water is very bright. Don't know if that will come across here. And then when it is convolved with the wind chime that you'd never hear directly, uh, the difference is to make it more subtle and complex is that the moving window is now at the level
of 100 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds. So instead of being echoes, you are convolving just little moments of this pitched wind chime. And I'll just play some of these together so when it happens in the piece, you'll recognize it. including octave transpositions down. So the I can't play the whole piece. I don't think we should take the time for that. But um, it goes through these very bright, happy sounds and then abstracts them so that the you only are left with the sustained frequencies. The raven is guiding you all through around. And then everything turns very dark, very, very dark indeed, uh, as we take uh, heavy rain and a gong instead of the wind chime at all lots of transpositions down it gets very dark and foreboding and then the morning happens and the birds come out and hopefully we're still waiting for our post-pandemic dawn to arrive but we emerge back into a beautiful soundscape so here at least is the uh, first little bit of that, and then we will pause for questions.
Okay, so let's now wind this up. And what I've tried to show you here is how working within the sound, uh, even at the micro sound level or the frequency time domain, for instance, uh, can interact with some real world and imaginary real world uh, contexts including going to the to the virtual um, they can create more idealized experiences of things in um, a in terms of a multi-channel environment or even in stereo the stereo versions of all of these pieces are available on our canadian site sonus.ca s-o-n-u-s and the um the soundscape um, database. Uh, there's no point in um, copying down this this um, URL. Uh, you just send me an email, and I give you a guest password. And I'm usually can do that within 24 hours, so you have access to it plus some uh, information about how how it's set up and what to look for and how to to use it. Particularly if you want to use. Safari or Firefox and use the embedded audio like I was doing today.